Welcome to your go-to Detroit Pistons podcast, The Pistons Pulse, co-hosted by me, Bryce Simon of Motor City Hoops and Detroit Bad Boys, a former D1 Hooper and high school coach, current teacher, husband, and father of three amazing kids. And I'm Omari Sanko for the second Pistons beat writer from Detroit Free Press. And we're coming to you live on Wednesday morning. Maybe a little more excitement in my voice than most Pistons <laughs> fans want. Omari is coming to you live from Chicago. And just so you guys know, we will be recording all the Pistons Pulse episodes this way moving forward. Now, the time varies. Sometimes we record Sunday morning. Sometimes it's Sunday evening. Sometimes it's Monday during the day. But we will be live on YouTube. I believe we're on Twitter right now on the Motor City Hoops Twitter. We'll eventually get it hooked up so you can uh, watch on Omari. Twitter as well and of course we got to give a shout out to our guy Wes he's always here with us doing the outlines putting this all together behind the scenes he actually did do an outline for this one but I do want to mention this is probably the first episode of Mari we've ever done where we're just going to kind of riff and let it flow drop comments in the YouTube channel if you have any we'll get those on the episode we'll answer those of course it'll be on all podcast platforms here in a few hours later today Omari Pistons dropped to five you were there last night. You've had a chance to talk to people. I, I know you don't have any feelings about this, but what's the vibe this morning? I mean, it was it was the worst possible result. So the vibes could be better. The vibes could be better. Uh, you know, it's it's just funny. It, well, it's funny to me because I was in the, the lottery drawing room and uh, it was just like, for me, it was just like, I was like darkly humorous to know the result before it went on TV. And then to like watch the broadcast and, it's like the entire draft goes in order and then it's like Pistons five and everybody gasps and then it's like commercial break. It's just like a lot of ways to unveil that pick. That was certainly the most dramatic way to go about it. But, you know, I would say, you know, at the end of the day, it's kind of just like what we've been talking about this whole time and that with the new odds, uh, it's very easy for the worst team to fall all the way down to five. You know, you have 140 combinations out of 1,001. And it's just really not that much. First eight percent chance really is not that that big. And it was essentially a coin flip for them to even draft top four and fall away to five. And that's what happened. So that's the way the lottery is designed to work. It wasn't rigged. It, you know, there wasn't any funny business. That's just how the numbers go. And obviously no Wimby, uh, likely no Brendan Miller or Scoot. But at five, there's still a lot of talent. And the bottom line for Detroit is that Regardless if they won this lottery or not, uh, they, were, they were still going to have to maneuver a lot in free agency and uh, have a lot happen just from a, a roster skill development standpoint to uh, turn those things around. So, you know, I guess now they can't really use Wimby as a crutch, right? If you get Wimby, you know, maybe that increases the talent floor enough that you can do something next season. Uh, now you're going to have to do it the hard way. And they've been doing it the hard way this whole time. And you also got K two years ago. So it's just back to the original plan, more or less. I think it's funny you bring up how the lottery is going in order because I was on with Wes and Jack and Blake Silverman over at DBB live stream. And thanks for everybody that tuned in over there. They're doing great things. And that's what it was like. Blake is reading it off and it's in order and it's in order. And I just made a big deal about you want it to go in order because that means the Pistons didn't get jumped or moved back. And then all of a sudden I wasn't watching it on the TV. I was just listening to Blake read it off. And then he goes, oh. And we are like, what happened? And he goes, Pistons at five. And I didn't have an over crazy reaction, Omari, but it just was kind of shock. I was not expecting five. As much as I had pitched that I thought they were going to get number one, I still was thinking two, three, four. So them going to five. But we talked about it, Omari, almost a 50% chance that they would land number five. And I'm with you. I'm glad you brought up the conspiracy theory. I don't, I don't understand that. I understand fans wanting to be frustrated and upset and everybody was excited about Wimby and we had done the Scoot and Brandon Miller debates and all that. I get it. But they got the number one pick just two years ago, Amari. There's not that high of a chance of getting the number one pick and they got it two years ago. So the chances they were going to get it again, just the, the mathematics weren't in their favor. So I do think, I like what you said, the margin of error is less, right? You get Wimby, it's almost a cheat code for the rebuild. Like you said, now you got to do it the hard way. There is a good player going to be available at five. I have no doubt. I know who I think it is. You may think it's somebody different. Weaver may think it's somebody else. But I would imagine if you go through every draft, you can find someone from five or beyond that was a really good player. 
maybe even a superstar. And it is now on Troy Weaver and his staff and the organization to locate that guy and draft him and then also build out the roster with $30 million in cap space and everything else. So it's not what you wanted, but it's not the end of the world for the rebuild. No, I mean, I bring this up a lot that this draft reminded me of 2019 and it even ended up being similar just from the standpoint of just all the shakeups in the top five and maybe this year wasn't quite as dramatic but uh, I mean you could just look at four years ago uh, the Knicks like the Pistons had 17 wins and they fell all the way down to three right it was a really it was a one player draft with Zion but two player including Ja and then number three was RJ Barrett so it was a similar draft as this where you have this prospect at the top who's seen as a franchise guy number two is a hyper athletic guard can get there the number three Barrett Brett and Miller to be somewhat similar players but maybe just uh just kind of in the same tier talent where i think there's a way better shooter but uh just being more of like the safe long side starter maybe all-star option and the Knicks and Cavs were coming off of 17 and 19 win seasons and they fell to third and fifth in essentially a two-player draft same odds as this year uh, the Phoenix Suns had 19 wins. They fought all the way down to six. And the Bulls with the fourth best odds fought all the way down to seventh. Uh, they were leapfrogged by two 33-win teams and the Pelicans and the Grizzlies, who I think had the sixth or seventh best odds or seventh and eighth or something like that. But it's the same odds. You know, it's the same odds that got them K two years ago. Uh, this is what the NBA wants. They want to discourage teams from tanking. They want to not give teams a reward for being the worst. And they want to incentivize finding ways to become good outside of the draft. And I think you can just look at the standings this year when you really only had a handful of teams who were not in the playing race at all, and they accomplished that goal. So, uh, you know, I say the hard way for the Pistons, but you also have to consider the fact that they didn't anticipate to be this bad coming into this season. Uh, they lost K 12 games into the year, and they came into this year maybe not expecting a playoff run, but, you know, expecting to make some meaningful progress on last season, and that didn't happen. So... You know, should the, the worst team always get the number, number one pick? I mean, it was like that for a long time, and we didn't have the parity that we have in the NBA, so there has to be some sort of trade off. But the bottom line for the Pistons and for Troy Weaver and the rest of that front office is that they can't let, you know, the lottery results, they can't let chances define where this rebuild goes, right? They have to figure out a way to get this thing going. There are, are teams who have won more games, so significantly worse lottery luck. You know, we saw Brooklyn. Uh, I know they're New York, but, you know, historically we're free agents, so they've been able to pull. And they came from nothing, right? And they were able to eventually build a team that allowed them to make some, some big moves and get some all NBA talent into the building, and they did it pretty organically. They didn't need a number one pick, so... You know, that's just how it goes. At the end of the day, the Pistons just have to figure it out. Sticking with that draft, Omari, because I have a, a good friend in the content creation space that's a Cavs fan, and he actually texted me last night. He goes, hey, we got Darius Garland at number five in 2019. Mm -hmm. So the draft you're talking about, Zion was this generational-type prospect, but injuries. John Morant has had a great start to his career, but there's some real off-the-court stuff, as we know. We're not going to get into it. R.J. Barrett probably hasn't lived up to number three. DeAndre Hurton was, Hunter was number four. Darius Garland at five. And then let me give you another name at 29, because remember, the Pistons have picked 31, where, you know, in that same range, Keldon Johnson went 29 to the Spurs. So I'm You can also saying, look at the 31st pick, Nick Claxton. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. I hadn't scrolled that far, but there yeah. you go, 31. <laughs> so my point is the margin for error is less. And I feel like I'm going to beat a dead horse with that phrase over the next month. The margin for error is less by not getting Wimby. Cade needs to be the face of the franchise. And I think it's important that we remind people a lot of us feel like or felt like and still do that Cade is a face of the franchise player. Everybody was up in arms that Jay Nivey wasn't first team all rookie. So that must mean people are pretty excited about what he is. Everybody loves Jalen Duran. If you're telling me you can get a Darius Garland type player at five and a Keldon Johnson type player or Nick Claxton type player, not saying those roles, but type player at 29 or at 31, or if you traded back into the first round, don't you feel pretty good still? Like, to me, this is the Detroit way. It's like, if you get Wimby, that's the nice, sexy, shiny, easy road. You know, Detroit is grinded out and tough. And, you know, 
I just feel like this fits Detroit better than getting the nice shiny toy. So I, I know that people are, you know, down. I realize I'm the internal optimist in Detroit Pistons fan base and people probably hate me for it. I understand it, but I just don't think the restoration and the rebuild is dead by any means because of this result. Yeah, I'm more of a, I wouldn't say I'm a, a pessimist. I'm more of a, you know, it's it, like it was a 14% chance this whole time. It wasn't a quarter yeah. to get with me. Like the odds were always slim. So, you know, and this was always, the you know, fifth pick, what, 47.9% chance. I like, guess to me, it's like, well, you know, like that was always a highly likely outcome and that's what happened. So, uh, you know, I just get confused when I check my mentions and people are like, I can't believe like this is absolutely rigged. The NBA has an anti-Detroit bias and this and that. And I'll talk about the lottery process. I watched them close in a little bit, but it's just, you know, it wasn't rigged. Like that's just how it goes. Uh, going back to 2019, uh, the five picks after Darius Garland were Jared Cover, Kobe White, Jackson Hayes, Ray Hashimura, and Cam Reddish. Uh, two of those, yeah, you know, like <laughs> I'm, two of those guys may not even be on a, on on a roster. And really, Rui is the only one in that group who's even ball, like yeah. a, you know pretty solid player. Uh, you know, Co- like Co- Kobe White's good. He's more of an off off the bench heater. But five is a good place to be. Five is better, especially in a draft like this where you don't really know who the studs are really once you get outside of the top three or four, like you want to be, you still want to be as high as possible. Like that doesn't change. I mean, when I was in high school, middle school, really just high school and, and college, I was watching the Pierre de Pistons basketball where they were picking, you know, seven through nine or seven through 10 every single year. And you can still get talented players there. I mean, they, they, they miss some guys, but that's tough. So, you know, it's, you know, that's the fifth overall pick. You know, if you can't find a good player with the fifth overall pick, then that, at the end of the day, reflects on the, the people making the picks and not necessarily the draft itself. You can look at any draft and you can see outside of that tw- top four or five, they are always, you know, above average players and that stars that come a little bit later. And I, I want to make a point, Omari, because I feel like I've gone a little, I, I complain about the pendulum swinging too far. Wimby would have been game changing for the Detroit Pistons yeah. organization in the city of Detroit. So I don't want to undermine or undervalue that. I understand completely why people wanted Wimby, why people were so excited about Wimby. And I'm not trying to undermine that about how important it could have been for the rebuild in the city. That would be unfair for us just to downplay that now that they haven't got him. But I think your point is, and I, you may, 14% chance. And here's like, they got the number one pick a couple years ago. Like they won the lottery two years ago and the likelihood of doing it again just isn't that great. So I don't want to undermine that. I will say for me, it was essentially the number one pick or if they didn't get number one, I wasn't going to be that upset because some of the guys I feel good about in a Cam Whitmore, even in the upside of Amin Thompson, I saw people tweeting about Amin a lot the last few days. You know, I think people would have been talking about Amin if they fell to number three. I really think that Amari, and there's a chance that he could be there at five. That's what's interesting is, you know, now we get the actual order and you start to play things out and see, okay, who really could be there at five, depending on how things go. Wes brought it up to me last night. He's like, I think there's a 10, 15% chance Brandon Miller falls to five. We have no idea what some of this stuff is going to do. So I don't think Scoot would fall to five, but I think just about anybody else would. So again, I just, I understand the frustration, but I still think that there's a path. So who are you taking at five, Bryce? So I will say that I would take Cam Whitmore. Like that's my immediate thought right now assuming it went the, t- the the normal three go right Wimby Scoot Brandon Mill I feel like we're done talking about those three for the most part right would you agree with that like we should I would agree yeah I would agree like unless they interview well or injury happens or something like they're probably going to be going by the time business comes so we can focus firmly on that next year yeah I mean I think Brandon Miller bad intel could drop him but if Brandon Miller's bad intel is so bad to drop him out of the top three then do you want to take him at five? Like that's, that becomes a whole nother conversation. I don't think Scoot gets there. So to me, it's a men, it's Cam, it's Jairus. So I'll just give you my list that I tweeted out. I have Cam and then a men, then Jairus Walker, Anthony Black, Asar, Taylor Hendricks. I've obviously soured just a little bit on Taylor Hendricks. So I would take Cam Whitmore. He would be the, the prize for me at number five. Yeah, I think Whitmore would be my pick too. And we've talked a lot about him over the past few weeks, but yeah, I think just, the perfect combination of a player who, you know, fits you from a need standpoint, but also arguably just best player available uh, long-term, almost star power pick. Uh, to me, that's just Whitmore. And 
I like I like Jairus Walker. There's other guys I can see working there. Like I like Anthony Black, but uh, you know, Cam Whitmore is. I mean, he had a really good comp. Like he had good athletic testing on the first day of the combine. So to see how the rest of the week goes, but. Uh, to me, that's that's everything you want in a fifth pick. You know, somebody who has the tools to contribute immediately, but also long term. You can see them like really booming and figuring it out, and you know, maybe making people reevaluate that draft order four or five years after the fact. All right, we're going to go to a short break here. If you're watching on YouTube, drop a comment. Wes will start putting those up. Amari will read one off here after we come back from the break. And if you're watching on Twitter, I am trying to check my Twitter account. So if you're watching on there, leave a comment underneath the live stream, and I'll read it straight off my Twitter account. It looks like we got some things coming in now. So when we come back from this break, Amari will start reading off some of these questions and comments. All right, we are back with segment two. Um, I want to talk about just being in the drawing room really quickly because it was, you oh, know, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, because I, it, uh, this is all Central Time, so I know a lot of our listeners are listening from 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 Eastern Time. So just move the the times back an hour, uh, five thirty. Uh, you know, we leave the media room, go into uh, the drawing room, uh, five forty five. We get our phones, reporters, whatever else confiscated. And uh, really what surprised me was just how fast the actual lottery process happened. Like I would say it started probably right around six and by six fifteen it was done. And I know it's not rigged. If you ever like growing up, you ever watched like the lottery drawings on like TV, like at seven PM or whatever, it's like the Powerball. They use that exact same like a similar machine in like the actual lottery room. And it's literally just four ping pong pong ball combinations. You have fourteen balls, it's four ping pong ball combinations. Uh they have this process to, you know, uh make sure that they're drawing the balls at the same time, 20 seconds for the first ball, 10 second intervals for each one. And then if you're watching on the broadcast, I don't know how many viewers we have because I'm just looking at StreamYard, but if you watch on the broadcast, I'm showing you, this is all of the combinations for every team. It's just a sheet of paper with all these numbers, but the Pistons, all the combinations started with one. Uh, so it went like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, five, or whatever. And it's funny, I think they have to do a total of like eight drawings because uh, the Spurs got the first one, obviously. And then they got the fourth one like twice and they have to keep redrawing it because Spurs combinations kept coming up. But certainly com- completely random. Uh, you know, it was just like the Spurs is lucky night, honestly. Uh, but it was also cool just to just be able to be in that room and you have representatives from every team and, you know, they're, you know, obviously hoping for a good result. But it's just a way different energy compared to being in the broadcast room. Like it was more business like, like a little bit more mechanical and buttoned up. Uh, Pitts is represented by John Phelps, who, you know, is one of their assistant GMs and he's actually based in New Orleans. So I'd actually never met him. So it's cool to be able to get to know him a little bit. And I promise you guys it wasn't rigged. Like, you know, I know I was one of the drawing room that, you know, everybody, you know, invested their powers into me to be able to <laughs> deliver the result back to Detroit. But it was, you know, it is it is as straightforward as it could get. And it, it, it's just kind of funny to know the result. There's like 40 people in the room and only those 40 people know the result. You're just waiting for the broadcast to catch up. Like the broadcast really is just for so. It all happens in that back room. I love it. All right, we got a question. Let's start getting to these. So guys, if you have something, drop it in the YouTube comments. Or again, I'll check my Twitter in a second. This is from our guy, Blake Silverman. Did a great job doing great things in Pistons NBA draft coverage. Go follow him. Go read him at Detroit Bad Boys. Amari, was there any reaction from the Spurs contingent in the lottery room when one of their combos was drawn first? Or did they keep it strictly business? Really good question from Blake there. Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, so they had Brian. Uh, they were re- represented by by Brian Wright, uh, who is a uh, who's the GM for the Spurs. And on stage, they're represented by R.C. Buford, who was the former GM. I think he's their CEO now. R.C. Buford's reaction was a lot more animated than Brian Wright's was. Uh, Brian Wright's is actually a former Pistons assistant GM, so I talked to him a little bit. Uh, he was there before I started covering the team, so uh, it was my first time meeting him. Uh, just Really chill, you know, like laid back guy. Uh, you know, he didn't like, you know, throw all this stuff in the air. There wasn't a big celebration or anything. But obviously, you could say after the fact that he was very happy with the result. Yeah, I bet it's hard to keep your composure. But you said it like it's a little more professional like and all of that. OK, I want to get into this one because this was a conversation that was happening yesterday in some chats I was a part of. So from Chris McCassell, Mike Sell, why do so many people feel like Troy Weaver is on the hot seat? 
I'm not sure how he could have done much better given what he started with. The 2020 could be on a list, but the whole draft was a mess. Chris, you were speaking directly to my, I swear you were in my phone yesterday because this is essentially the exact point I made. Where have Troy Weaver's big moves, where has he been able to make them? Like, where have the opportunities been? Now, the 2020 draft was a mess. It looks like Killian was a miss, right? I think everybody would agree with that. But it was his first draft as a GM. A lot of GMs miss with their first draft. Again, I'm a Chiefs fan. If you follow Brett Veach, the Kansas City Chiefs GM, his first couple drafts were a mess. Now he's three, four, five years into it. He's getting really good at it. And I realize people are going to say Patrick Mahomes, whatever. Not like he just drafts good players. So I don't mean to give Troy a pass, but it's somewhat understandable. That was a missed opportunity, though. The Jeremy Grant turning into Jalen Duran, all that stuff looks like a win. Boyan looks like a win. Cade Cunningham, even if you don't want to give him credit, was a win. Jaden Ivey looks like a win. I think there's a couple really big moves like we've talked about coming up this offseason. I don't, my belief has waned a little bit, Omari. I think early on we gave him a little too much credit, but I don't think he's on the hot seat because I just don't know what you point to and say, oh my God, this is just awful. Yeah, no, he's not on the hot seat. Like, I think fans get impatient with just losing games, which, I mean, they've been losing games for 15 years, so I get it. Uh, the reality is that a lot of rebuilds start off with assets so you can flip into more assets, right? And the Pistons just didn't have that. They didn't get anything for Blake Griffin. That's his contract, actually, so you just had... It was a uh, negative, negative yeah. asset for Mari. So it was a, a, a negative asset. Like, you just had this giant contract taking up about a fourth of the cap, uh, and they just had to wait for it to come off of the books, so... I mean, really, this rebuild, if you consider when Blake Griffin's money came off of the books in 2021, I believe, this rebuild to me is really only, as far as the Troy Weaver part, has really only gotten going for two years. We consider just the cleanup work he had to do to get off of that previous era uh, where you had, uh, you know, like Blake Griffin and, you know, Derrick Rose played a lot of minutes and, uh, you know, those were still two of the guys on the team and, I think they got a second round pick and like did a smooth junior for Derrick Rose, but uh, they just couldn't create any positive momentum immediately. They had to dig themselves out of a hole. And to me, that makes this rebuild very different from like a Memphis where uh, they got a treasure trove of assets for uh, Mark Saul and Mike Conley. And that really kind of jump started, especially when they moved up to number two and got John. That really jump started uh, their rebuild or OKC. Uh, you know, you have. You know, these really talented players who are still playing high-level basketball, and you flip them and you get all these draft picks back. Uh, the Pistons just didn't have that. So, you know, I think there's a lot of fans who don't really pay attention to, like, the cap side, the asset side. But a lot of rebuilds, if a lot of rebuilds start from zero and then you make moves and you get to 10, uh, the Pistons started at zero, went to, like, negative 20. Not sure would respond at all. Any GM would have had to just bite the bullet and, um, you know, buy Blake Griffin out of his deal just because he didn't have any value around the, the league. He was on a max contract. And then you have a max contract and that salary on the books the next season, and you just kind of have to wait it out. So none of that straight was fought. He had to come in and, and essentially do cleanup, and he's done that. Uh, they have young players. you got Bogey and Alec Burks and these talented vets. Uh, we didn't really see the results of that work last season with K going out. But, like, to me, uh, this team is just in a significantly better spot than it was three years ago, and that's inarguable to be. Like, it hasn't translated to wins, but this team is absolutely in much better shape than it was when he took over. So you had to pay Blake Griffin to go away, and you didn't get much back for Derrick Rose. You got Dennis Smith Jr., right? Let me read you what the Utah Jazz started their rebuild with, having Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. This is what they returned to Mari. Colin Sexton, Lori Markinen, Ochai Abaji, three picks, two pick swaps, Four more picks, Walker Kessler, who was a Rookie of the Year candidate, Malik Beasley, Pat Beverly, Jared Vanderbilt. Those guys then got moved for more picks. My point is, the Pistons paid Blake to go away and got Dennis Smith Jr., maybe a second-round pick. Maybe they had to send out a second-round pick with Derrick Rose. That's not even close to what the Utah Jazz just started their rebuild with. And I know not every team gets to start with what the Jazz started with, but it's just they literally started with nothing. Weaver started with nothing, and then on top of it, it slowed it down because he did miss with his first pick. I will say that Killian Hayes is a miss. I realize there's still a path to maybe a backup point guard, but you still probably want a little bit more than that at number seven. So it was always going to take longer than what I think a lot of us wanted to, definitely than what I thought it was going to whenever it first started. I mean, I was the 
crazy person that thought they were going to the playoffs the year they drafted Cade. So I think we've all been put in check a little bit, but I still think it's on a decent path. And again, Omari, I'm interested in what you think. This is a big offseason. You have a coaching hire, you have the number five pick, you have another pick, and you have 30 plus million dollars in cap space this offseason. So there's some big moves coming this offseason that really determine where the trajectory goes. Absolutely. I mean, they have a lot of tools this summer to, you know, push this rebuild even further into the right direction. You have 30 million in cap space, which maybe you go get a free agent. But I also think there's a good chance that they can make a trade to get somebody in who kind of fills some of the holes they have on the roster. Uh, you have the fifth pick. And I mean, then you have all these players coming back next season, including Kay Cunningham. So in a sense, you are getting a first overall pick back because Kay has only played 74 games in two years. So uh, there's still a lot to look forward to. And just in my experience, like once things click, uh, they could turn around pretty fast. So uh, whether or not that'll be next season for the Pistons remains to be seen. But uh, to me, like this franchise is still in, in, in perfect position to turn things around pretty quickly. So I just don't I just don't see Trey Weaver being on the hot seat at all. All right, from Andrew Haig, is it too simple to think that the number five spot boils down to Cam Whitmore versus Min Thompson? I will say, real quick, that's what it is for me right now. Those are the two guys I have pinpointed. I will obviously start diving into more. Like, if the Pistons would have landed the number one pick, I would have watched a lot more Victor Wimbanyama film over the next few weeks. If they would have landed two or three, it would have dove more into Scoot Henderson and Brandon Miller film. Now it's going to be Cam, Amin, Asar, Hendricks, Anthony Black. I'm missing one, Jairus Walker. Those type. I, I'm starting to get a lot more Grady Dick, you know, comments in my Twitter timeline. So that's another. I've watched a lot of him. I don't know that I agree with him at number five. For me, right now, it's Whitmore versus Thompson. Wes is on my case every day about Anthony Black. Omari, is there another guy that you would put in with those two, just as the data we have and kind of how you feel right now this morning? Yeah, I mean, there's a, a, a few guys. I think the draft is wide open at, at five, right? Like you could put Jarris Walker in there. You could ask Black in there. Maybe even Taylor Hendricks. Uh, maybe even Asar Thompson. Uh, you know, I think you're going to spend the next month really kind of uh, digging deeply into all these prospects and figuring out which one fits their program the best. So I don't think it boils down to two guys. I think it could be a lot of guys. To me, it kind of makes it more fun in a way. And I know if it, fans don't want to hear that because fans aren't here to like have fun and talk about NBA draft prospects the way I enjoy it. But to me, this gives us eight, nine guys to talk about plus trade scenarios and all. If Victor was number one, it would have been exciting. I know Wes was dreading a little bit, like what are we going to put on the outline every week if they have the number one pick because it's completely done. Now we can do an episode a week just on you know every prospect that might be available for him at number five or might be in play. I think the trade thing is interesting. I believe you had a quote last night from Troy, something about, I don't know if it was trading up, trading back, trading it for a player. Didn't he have a comment about the potential of trading the pick? Yeah, uh, he was asked directly about it, and he acknowledged that it was a possibility. So that's also on the table. We got one more question, and then we do got to cut it short. We're only going to go 30 minutes this morning, guys. I'm actually in my classroom. I know I got this behind me, but it covers up my whiteboard, and I got school kids walking in my room here in about 15, 20 minutes. So we did want to get this out. I got to get it edited into our guy, Robin, so we can have it out on podcast platforms. And Omari has a big day at the Combine. I believe five on five start this afternoon. So this will be a fun day at the NBA Draft Combine. So I, I did want to get this from Harry Murat. Like he, you were on the uh, chat last night. And so appreciate all of your support. What is the most money? And I don't know what that one means. Oh, time. So how long is the link? You'd be down. I'm not very good with emojis. My bad. You'd be down with paying to bring Jeremy Grant back. You know, we kind of mentioned it last week. Like, I think, uh, especially with the way the cap's going to go up, you're going to have players making 60 million a year, uh, not too not too long from now. Uh, to me, like, if you can get Jeremy for 30 a year, I think that's 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 pretty great. You know, he already knows the system. Well, I guess not anymore because I'm a, a new coach, but he knows the organization. He knows the front office. He knows a lot of guys on his team. Uh, just on paper, I think he really fits, you know, exactly uh, what you need. Just has a really big wing slash power forward who can knock down threes. So I think 30 a year is probably the sweet spot for him. Yeah, and I think it's going to be interesting what the Blazers do. Do they go full rebuild? Do they decide to trade Dame and draft Scoo and start – somewhat fresh with the scoot shade and sharp combination i think that would be you know more inclined to jeremy walking away from portland and possibly back in detroit and one thing i want to emphasize if jeremy comes back to detroit 
He knows what he's signing up for. He knows the role he's signing up for. And for me, it's a perfect role for him where he can be impactful on the boards, on the defensive end of the floor, and all of those things. So, yes, we've talked about it on previous episodes. I don't think I, I wouldn't go over 30. I'm a little even uncomfortable at 30. I don't know if 30 gets it done or not. And I would go, you know, one of those three plus ones, Harry, something like that is, you know, in terms of the years. I don't know how all the CBA stuff works. Is that something you can do with the unrestricted free agent? I know different teams can give different things, but something under 30, I would love 25. I'm just not sure that's realistic. It's not a great free agency class. So I don't know what the market is going to be for some of these guys and how much money they're really going to get. And then before we go, Richie, Cancun, you ask about the pros and cons of Hendricks and Jarris Walker, another version of Isaiah Stewart. Richie, we will be back recording either Sunday or Monday. And I promise you, we're going to be talking about all of these guys. So I, we got to go for today, but we will put out a full episode next week on Tuesday. So look out on Twitter or subscribe here to the YouTube channel. We'll schedule it ahead of time. We'll be back recording sometime Sunday or Monday for the episode to go out on Tuesday. And we'll break down Hendricks, Jairus Walker, Anthony Black, the Thompson Twins, all those guys. We'll be doing all of that stuff. But we got to go for today. Thank you for joining us. Everybody that watched on YouTube and Twitter, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. This was awesome. We wanted to get an episode out. Everybody listen on Apple, Spotify, leave us a rating and review. Help us continue to grow. Thank you, Amari, for getting up early this morning. Wes, same thing. Amari, take it away, my guy. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning, everyone. I know you're probably feeling the, the hangover from last night, but we will be back and we will give you everything you need to know about this number five pick. Uh, so big thanks to our audio producer, Robin Chan, our executive producer, Anjanette Delgado, and our sports editor, Kirkland Crawford. Also big thanks to Wes Davenport, as always, and talk to you all next week.